Welcome everybody. I'm going to be doing a code walkthrough of multi-site and I'm going to be focusing mostly on the replication side. So I'll start by talking through some high level stuff um, about how the log based replication works, what the different multi-site logs are, um, what the threading model of sync is and how the coroutines work. And then I'll get into some of the code for metadata and data sync. Uh, so to start out, this is log-based replication. So if we're talking about two different clusters in a different parts of the world, um, we're going to put a zone on each one of them and link them together so that when a zone A makes a change, it writes that change to a, a log locally, and zone B will be reading the logs from zone A. and each time that it sees something change, it will fetch the latest copy of that thing. And so as zone B makes progress through the log of zone A, it's going to track its progress in a, a sync status object locally. Uh, so the, the main logs for replication, there's the metadata log, which records all of the changes to users and buckets. Um, there's the bucket index log, which is stored inside the bucket index, which records all of the changes to objects. And then there's another data changes log, which records which buckets and their shards have changes in them. Um, because you can't really pull every single shard of every single bucket's log, so we pull the data changes log to figure out which buckets have changes so that we can spawn sync on uh, the buckets that we're focused on. Uh, each of these multi-site logs are sharded across multiple Rados objects. This is for two main reasons, um, spreading the reads and writes across OSDs in the cluster, and also spreading the replication work across different gateways that may be running in the same zone. Um, so the sharding for the metadata log defaults to 64 objects, the data log is 128, and the bucket index log shares the same shard count as the bucket index. Uh, so the, the threading model is that we uh, run one thread for a metadata sync, Uh, and one thread for data sync against each source zone that we're syncing data from. Um, metadata, um, there is a, a single zone that is the metadata master zone. All other zones only sync from the master, but data sync is active active. So Basically, every zone is syncing data from every other zone in its zone group. Uh, so in RGW Rados here, you can see the MetaSync processor thread, which is running the, the coroutine uh, scheduler for the metadata sync. And there's the data sync processor thread here that's doing the same against a single zone. Now. Um, I mentioned that all the logs are sharded, so each of these threads is going to be processing a lot of shards in parallel, and that's where the coroutines come in. Uh, basically, we want to do everything um, asynchronously uh, so that we don't block a thread or a single shard. So the the coroutine stuff is all in RGW coroutine.hncc. Uh, there's a RGW coroutine class, which is based on a boost ASIO coroutine. And uh, effectively, it's just this um, virtual ant operate function. So the, the operate function just gets called each time that it's ready to run. It'll 
do some work and then yield back. And once it gets rescheduled, the operator will get called again. Uh, the next class here is the coroutines stack. So a, a stack is just a, a list of coroutines where it runs each one to completion before starting on the next one. And then there is a coroutines manager here, which acts as a scheduler of the coroutine stacks. So keeps a list of stacks that are ready to run, loops through them and calls their operate functions. Um, and so the coroutine manager just has a run function, which is synchronous and it just transfers control and runs all of the coroutines until everything completes. If I might ask a question, Casey. So the coroutine Please. stack is uh, is almost like a call stack. So coroutines can invoke other coroutines, um, and then when the later coroutine returns, it's back to the calling coroutine, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so I'm going to talk now about the the two different ways that you can um, call it another coroutine. Um, the first is is the call function where you pass a, a new coroutine class to it and that calls the asks that coroutine to the same coroutine stack as the, the existing one which means that the scheduler will run that new coroutine to completion before um, before rescheduling this one so it's a good way to uh, call something that seems synchronous wait for it to complete and get its return value. So the other one is spawn, which adds the coroutine to a different coroutine stack, which means that it, the caller will continue running. So spawn is a good way to uh, write multiple coroutines and let them run in parallel. And then there are some collect functions which deal with um, getting the results of a spawned coroutine uh, once it completes. So that's a, a high level overview of the RGW coroutine framework. Um, so I'm going to go into a quick example coroutine uh, called the continuous lease CR. This is uh, part of the strategy for um, sharing the processing of log shards across multiple gateways in a zone. Uh, basically, in order to work on a shard, you have to take a CLS lock on that shard object, and the continuous least CR is what helps coordinate that. And so here we have uh, an example of a coroutines operate function. So this this function just keeps getting called by the scheduler, and we have this re-enter macro, uh, which is implemented as a switch statement under the hood. But basically, it means that each time that you yield, um, the the next time you get called. You'll, you'll resume from where you yielded. So that's what the re-enter is for. So the continuous least CR, the first thing that it tries to do is take a Rados lock. This um, simple Rados lock CR is a coroutine wrapper around a, a CLS lock call to Rados. Um, so here we use yield call, which means that this coroutine will suspend and we'll only resume once the lock completes. And because it's synchronous, we can check its return code here to see whether it succeeded or failed. And if it failed, we set the error state, uh, which will tell the, the scheduler not to call or operate anymore, and it'll uh, unwind. Similar with the setting state to done, means that we're done processing and we won't run anymore. 
Uh, but the interesting thing about about the continuous lease is that it's a, a while loop. So we'll we'll take the lock for a given interval, which is uh, I believe something like uh, 60 seconds, two minutes maybe. And so we, if we take this lock, we will wait for half of that interval and then uh, renew the lock. So the idea is that as long as the continuous lease CR is running, we'll take the lease and keep renewing it. And if it ever fails, then we'll set that we're not locked. And it's up to the calling coroutine to detect that and stop working. Any questions about the continuous lease? Not yet. Maybe a slightly more general question. Is there anything else that can follow yield other than call or wait, or are those the only two things that can follow yield? Uh, spawn is another time that you'll see it. Got it. Uh, so with that, I'm going to jump into metadata sync, which is all in rgwsync.cc. And I will start with metasync shard CR wherever it is. There we go. So metasync shard CR, we spawn one of these for each shard of the metadata log that we're processing. And so I'll go through its operate kind of at a high level and talk about how it works. So when you start sync on a shard, uh, we have the sync marker, which tracks the status, and it starts in full sync. Uh, before we get here, we will have built a full sync map, which basically lists all of the metadata objects in the shard and stores them. And so uh, the full sync function here will just be walking over the entries in that map and syncing each thing. And once that completes, we'll transition to incremental sync and call that one. So this operate function is a bit different than the continuous lease. Uh, here we don't see a re-enter function or the, the macro that, that uh, the re-enter macro. Instead, we have a different one in uh, full sync and incremental sync. So here we're in the full sync function and we have a re-enter on the full CR, which is a SEO coroutine for this function. And the first thing that we try to do is start a continuous lease. So we allocate the coroutine here and we call spawn um, to spawn it in a separate stack. And we, we keep track of that, that stack for reference counting here. And there's this while loop that basically waits until it succeeds in getting the lock. If it fails, we'll see done here and we'll return the error. Otherwise, we just yield until it succeeds in locking. And then we'll continue on. I, I just have a question. Please. At, at, at what point uh, do you think would uh, uh, a lease lock fail? And what, what sort of uh, scenarios? Okay, yeah. So if, if you're running two different gateways in the same zone and the other gateway succeeded in taking the lock, then our request to lock the object would fail. Okay. So in that case, we will just return an error up and we'll, we'll wait on a timer and try again later. So in that way, every gateway is continuously polling on these locks. And so how long does it wait until it tries again? Is there a time out there? Or, uh, uh, good question. Uh, the thing that we, the thing that is responsible for this is called a back off control CR. 
Um, looks like it's a maximum of 30 seconds and it'll start. Okay. Not sure exactly what it starts with, but there's this back off control coroutine that will keep calling a, uh, a coroutine uh, until, until it succeeds. So it's just rerunning things um, in response to these least failures. Right, okay. So we're in full sync here. And uh, we, we create this MetaSync shard marker track. Uh, this basically keeps track. Run, run. Matt, could you please mute? Here, does it work? So we have a, a marker tracker here, which basically keeps track of the, um, the entries that we're trying to sync and the entries that we've succeeded. The goal is to make sure that we update the sync status marker to reflect uh, the, the complete progress that we've made. Um, so we get into a do while loop here. Each time we make sure that we still have the lease, otherwise we'll drop out. And then we list some OMAP keys. Here we're listing the, the full sync map. So metadata full sync, it, it's just a list of all the metadata entries that we need to sync. Uh, Casey, so, yes, uh, what does a sync marker look like? I mean, uh, what's it initialized to and once it's updated, what would it be? Yeah, like? that's a good question. Um, so each each kind of sync is going to have a different uh, a different marker format and and uh, for metadata it's this meta sync status header that shows here we have the, a global one that says whether we're in uh, initializing building full sync maps or syncing. Mm -hmm. And once we get to syncing, we'll start tracking a, a per shard uh, marker for each shard. So each shard can be in full sync or incremental sync. And then it keeps uh, some state about the, the, the state that it's in. So the incremental sync, it's mainly just the, the marker which stores its position in the incremental sync, uh, it's, its marker in the remote logs um, listing. Okay. So the, the sync markers are stored in Rados objects in the log pool. Um, so back to full sync. Um, we're reading. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, how do you decide what gets called as a separate coroutine and what gets done inline? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's kind of a trade off between design and efficiency. Um, you can do synchronous things inline, or you can use yield call. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I guess it's not cut and dry. Maybe another help? more general question in the, on your, on the left side there, I see a yield and then without the word call, lease CR go down. And then even further down, I see yield followed by a block. You kind of explain those two constructs. Sure. Uh, so the, the yield in a block, it, it wraps a call to spawn. So it's very similar to just saying yield spawn, except it gives you a scope where you can have local variables uh, because the re-enter macro is implemented as a switch statement. It's complicated to, to have local variables because they can't cross uh, cases in a switch statement. So anytime that you need local variables, you can wrap it in a, a block after the yield, and that ensures that it, it won't uh, span a case. Got it. Okay. 
So you you yield and it spawns, and then when we come back, we'll resume after the yield. Um, here, there's a, a yield least CR go down. Um, this is telling the the core routine to stop, and we basically yield here so that the core routine has a or the least core routine has a chance to run and shut down. And then we use this drain all, which waits for all of the spawned core routines to complete, and um, and then it's safe for us to return. Um, if we don't drain all of the core routines, then we may leak memory. Um, or spawned coroutines may have pointers to this coroutine, and so you could have use after free issues. Um, so collecting and draining coroutines before you exit is uh, is important. Got it. I'm still trying to. So is, this is like a that yield is like a yield call in that it's going to run that to completion before it comes back. Uh, yield basically just means that we're going to return from the from the operate function, which means that we're returning control up to the coroutine scheduler, and that allows the coroutine scheduler to call operate on other coroutines. If our coroutine is still scheduled, which means it's not blocking on something else, then the coroutine schedule will, will eventually get back to, to it. But yield is basically a way to let the scheduler run other things. Got it. So it, it returns, but then if it ever comes back into, if the schedule ever comes back here, the first thing that's run is least CR go down? Or what, what's, the, what's the sequence between returning out of operate and go down being called? Right. So. Uh, when you when you yield something that that runs immediately, and then then the return happens. Similar to this block here, everything inside of the block runs, and then then it returns control, and and will resume from where it left off later. Got it. And and how would it be different if that first yield were a yield call instead of just a yield followed by the function call? What would be the the semantic difference between those two. Well, let me jump into go down. Yes. Um, so here it's just a function call. We're not creating a another coroutine and scheduling it. So we're we're just uh, running okay. a function and uh, changing the state of other coroutines. So, Got it. Okay, that's that's that clarifies things right there. Yeah. So wake up means that the least coroutine will be schedulable. So so we yield in order for the coroutine scheduler to be able to run it first. Got it. So if there was a wait call in that uh, coroutine, um, wake up causes it to be scheduled before that wait complete. Mm hmm Right. Okay, so we we talked about full sync. We're storing the the full sync map, which is a list of all of the metadata to to sync in OMAP, and so we're reading OMAP keys of the next um, n entries that we're going to process here. So we get that in a a map of entries, and we loop over that map. Um, and because there's a yield on the inside, we can't have local variables like a normal um, ranged for loop here. We actually need to store the iterator in the class itself. Um, the one thing I noticed earlier in this, there was a, there was the, there was one of Yehuda's pound defines of a magic number of 100 for OMAP keys. Yes. Which didn't seem like a great number, and it's written in the code. As a uh, agreed. Could we maybe yep. think about looking, sweeping through at some point and lifting some sure. things like that? Yeah, there there are quite a few of these. Um, it would be interesting to have 
control over some of them in the configs. But yeah, let's definitely loop back and look at those. Um, so here we are in the for loop over entries that we need to full sync. Um, we tell the marker tracker that we're starting on this marker entry. So it'll watch for the completion, whether it succeeds or fails, to know whether it can update our, our marker position. And then we spawn a metasync single entry CR, which will actually go off and read the remote metadata from the other zone and store it in our local metadata pool. Um, so I'm gonna gonna skip over that one for now. Um, but Matt pointed out the magic number of 100 here means that we're gonna be processing 100 uh, metadata entries at a time and we're spawning all of those to run in parallel. So once we get to the end of the for loop, we'll collect children, which basically waits on all of them to complete. And the outer while loop is over the listing of the OMAP keys. And if there are more entries, meaning we're not done yet, we'll just continue the listing. So once we exit this loop, it means we've either hit an error or we've succeeded in full syncing everything in the shard. Um, if we still have the lock, meaning that it's safe to update our state, then we'll switch the sync status to incremental. And we'll start from the log position when we started full sync, basically meaning that we won't miss anything that was added. Um, since we built the full sync map. And here we use yield call write marker CR to write the sync marker into the Rados object. So if all's well, uh, we will. Where are the marker objects those are stored? So this is in the log pool. And we have a shared abj name function which formats the a prefix with the shared ID. Got it. So if all goes well, we will drop the lease and we'll drain all of the coroutines and we will uh, finally update our local variable with the sync marker uh, and full sync will return back and we'll resume in this operate function next time we get called we'll enter into incremental sync so incremental sync looks similar uh, we we take the lease we create a, a marker tracker, which will update the, the incremental sync marker as we make progress. And we resume from the marker position that we have stored in, the, in our local sync marker variable. So the loop for incremental sync looks fairly similar, except that instead of reading from OMAP, we are reading from the remote zones metadata log. And here we use clone meta log coroutine to read that, read a listing from that log and we store it locally. Um, metadata sync is special in that it stores the log entries locally. And this is important for us to be able to fail over to other master zones. Uh, if we don't store the metadata log, then we wouldn't be able to serve metadata sync to other zones in the event that we're promoted. So we, we clone a list of metadata log entries, and then we'll read from that in a loop and process them. Similarly to full sync, where we use metasync single entry CR, uh, and we will think? spawn a lot in parallel. Yes. Uh, so before looking into our remote uh, metadata log entries, does it actually look 
in its own metadata log entry first. Because it could be primary, right? And it doesn't exactly know whether it's primary or if it's secondary. Um, okay, so I mentioned that there's a single zone that is the metadata master. That metadata data master zone is not running metadata sync. Only the non-master zones are running sync against the master zone. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay, and uh, so we're running a lot of these MetaSync single entry coroutines in parallel. We're tracking their, their markers and looking for their completions. If everything succeeds, then we can update our marker position to reflect how, how far we got. Uh, and we'll just keep looping over the um, clone metadata log read metadata log and metasync single entry loops. Um, so once we finish listing, we will collect all of the children, meaning that we wait for the, the spawn stacks to complete. Um, and here, if we've gotten to the end of the listing, which means that our log marker is equal to the maximum marker that we've cloned from the other zone. Then we'll just wait for 20 seconds um, and then pull the log again to see if there's new changes. Um, so that's that's the, the kind of the main loop of metadata sync. Any questions about this? If not, I'll go ahead and move on to data sync, which you can find in rgwdatasync.cc. And very similar to how we run a metasync shard CR on every shard of the metadata log, data sync shard CR is processing a single shard of the data changes log. And let's see, we've got a test cluster running here. I can show what the data log looks like. Really just, I have one change here and it's really just saying that there's a change in this bucket instance. Uh, and if the bucket was sharded, it would say which shard had that change in it. So data sync shard CR's job is basically just to look at each, each of these changes and spawn a bucket sync process on that shard of the bucket. Um, Similarly to metadata sync, we're still doing a full sync and an incremental sync. Full sync is going to build a list of all of the bucket shards and it will spawn bucket sync on each one of those. And incremental sync will be watching this data log and spawning bucket sync on uh, bucket shards that have changes. Um, so the full sync, uh, I think the, the structure is very similar to metadata sync. Uh, the list is stored in OMAP. We read a batch of keys, loop over them, and spawn a data sync single entry coroutine for them. And here we enforce a spawn window so that if we've spawned more than that many, we'll wait for the next one to complete and collect its result. Um, we'll jump into data sync single entry real quick and show that it's really just calling run bucket sync coroutine. Uh, and I'll talk about bucket sync in more detail in a bit. Uh, so if 
once we get to the end of full data sync, we'll update the marker to say incremental sync and transition down to incremental sync. And this one is reading from a remote data log shard, but there's a couple other things going on here. So basically we're we're feeding into a list of bucket shards that have changes and we'll we'll process each. Um, there's also this error repo that we have here um, where we'll store bucket shards that failed to sync in the past and we will uh, retry batches of these. Um, as we make progress in incremental sync. This is different from metadata sync because metadata sync will block when it hits an error and keep retrying. But for data sync, we want to keep trying all of the all of the buckets in the data log. And if something fails, we don't want to stop progress. We just want to make sure that we we try it again later. Most of the time, it's just a, a lease failure. And so this loop here, just make sure that we keep trying things in the error repo until they succeed. Uh, but both of these feed into the same list of, of entries, which we are processing down here. Um, so we loop through the log entries and we'll spawn a data sync single entry, which runs the bucket sync. Uh, again, we enforce a spawn window to make sure that we're not processing too many things at a time. Um, and that's about it. It just keeps updating the marker as it makes progress. Uh, so I'll go ahead and jump into bucket sync. Um, so bucket sync is taking a lease on um, bucket sync status objects in the log pool. Um, it also starts with an incremental sync and transition, sorry, starts with a full sync, which lists all of the objects in that bucket shard. And then once it completes that, it transitions to incremental sync, which reads the bucket index log. Uh, and in this case, instead of full sync and incremental sync just being different member functions, they are their own coroutines. So we have a bucket shard full sync CR, which will loop through the entries in, in the bucket listing and use a bucket sync single entry CR to sync, a, to sync an object in the bucket. And then real quick down to incremental sync. Here we're listing the bucket index log from another zone and processing log entries. Um, each log entry have a quick example of a bucket index log. And this is just the creation of a single object here. Each Bucket index transaction starts with a prepare step, which will have a state pending and a complete step. Uh, and sync is only looking at the complete ones. So here we have a, a write to an object ASD. Um, and so this is what uh, bucket sync is looking at. Um, so there's some some logic about uh, ordering of of entries, if um, we have multiple changes to a single object, we'll use a squash map, which kind of tracks which which change happened last. Uh, and so we'll only try to apply that latest change instead of all of the ones in order. Uh, and so we have a, a loop over each of these entries 
there's a lot of kind of early exits here because we only want to process the ones that are completed. Um, we'll skip uh, log entries if we've already processed them on this zone. The entries store a trace of the zones that have sunk them. Um, and eventually we'll get down to bucket sync single entry CR. And this is what actually looks at the type of app that the, the log entry is uh, about. So if it's an if it's a write, then you'll see add here. Uh, a write of a version to object shows up as link OLH. And then there's a separate block to handle deletes or removal of versioned objects. But for creates, we just call the sync object function. There's an abstraction called the sync module, um, but by default, we use this fetch remote obj coroutine. Um, so to, to fetch an object, we are sending a get request to the other zone, reading the object and writing it to a local object in this bucket. Um, won't go into too much detail there, but this is using um, this is using a, a timestamp check to make sure that the version that the other zone has is more recent than ours. Otherwise, we won't we won't try to copy it. And similarly for for deletes, there's a remove object. For delete markers, there's a create delete marker. Was there a question? Um, on timestamps, so um, is there a necessity that like both the zones should have a similar timestamp? Like for example, what happens if the other zone's clock is not in sync and it's in a more advanced timestamp? So do we resolve on version numbers then? Uh, no, we we do rely on on time skew not being too large, so we do rely on on timestamps here. Um, okay. So potentially, if there is skew, then you could the sync could converge on a, an object that was written before a write that happened on another zone but at least all zones would converge on the same version of the object, if that makes sense. Got it. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the place where we, I believe, is this the error repo? No, it's not. That happens at a, a higher level. Um, sorry, I'm not seeing it. But if uh, if there's a, a failure here, where is it? Right, that's up at a higher level. Um, so run bucket sync. If it okay. Uh, so data sync single entry was coming from data sync. If run bucket sync coroutine returns an error, then we will. We will write the key that failed to an error repo. And it was this error repo that drove the retries in the data sync incremental sync. If we got this entry from the error repo, then we'll remove it from OMAP so that we stop retrying uh, as long as we succeeded. Uh, and then if we did succeed, then we'll we'll update the, the marker position 
accordingly. So that's a high level view of metadata sync, data sync, and bucket sync. And I have time for plenty of questions. Um, was there anything, Shilpa, that I missed from, from your list that you want me to cover? Uh, yeah, the, the multi part objects is that treated differently than the regular objects. Okay, yeah. So uh, if you upload a multi part upload to a zone A, for instance, um, zone B is just going to see as in, a single a uh, bucket index log entry for that entire upload. And we'll just use a get request to fetch the whole thing. So if you get a multi-part ob object, you'll still just get the entire contents in a single body. So we replicate multi-part objects as a single object and we'll store them as a single object on the, the target zone. Okay, so if there are any parts that are missing, then we won't be able to identify that. That right? Sorry, sorry. Can you repeat? If there's any any multi-part object that's missing, any part multi-part that is missing within the object, we won't be able to identify that, and we still think it. Uh, well, if the object is not complete, I mean. Right. So we don't generate a bucket index log entry until complete multi-part happens. So at that point, okay. we expect to have all our all, all parts and be able to read it. I see. Okay. Uh, let's see, I, I see a question about does metadata sync recognize deletes? And that's that's a good question. Um, there's a meta sync single entry. And all this tries to do is read remote metadata from the metadata master zone. And if we get it, you know what? Well, we will actually remove it. So it's it's not recognizing deletes. It's just seeing seeing a metadata key, trying to fetch it from the master. And if it doesn't exist, then we'll remove our local copy if we have one. Okay. So the intent is just to um, end up with the same result that the master zone has. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just want to understand what is the bucket entry point mean? Sure. Um, so there's there's two metadata objects that represent a bucket. The one that contains the bucket info, it's metadata, like it's apples and number of shards, et cetera, is in the bucket instance. But we have a a uh, kind of indirection in the form of a bucket entry point. Um, the bucket entry point uses a Rados object name of the bucket itself. So if you get a request for a bucket, you look up its entry point first, and the entry point will say what the current instance of that bucket is. So that points you to the, the bucket instance metadata to actually get its attributes. Okay, got it. So if, if you delete and recreate a bucket, for example, you'll get a different bucket instance and be able to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And if you reshard a bucket, you'll create a new bucket instance, do the reshard into that, and then update the entry point to point at the new bucket instance. So metadata sync kind of treats these two objects uh, completely independently, and it'll just fetch the current copy of each. Mm -hmm. Um, when we looked at metadata sync, we noticed that we were 
listing a hundred things at a time and doing them in parallel. So we kind of just read them and let them race. So I, I see some questions in the in the in the deck about uh, zones and zone groups. Um, in in this talk, we're kind of just assuming two zones in one zone group replicating from each other, but it's possible to configure other zone groups. Um, so by default, uh, you, you can't sync data between zone groups. Data only syncs between zones in the same zone group, but metadata sync will replicate metadata across all zone groups. So all zone groups will be able to see the users and the buckets in the entire system, but data in those buckets will only be resident in a single zone group. Uh, so Casey, uh, I have I had those questions. So what is the idea behind having a zone group? What is the advantage we get by grouping particular zones? Yeah, that, that's a good question, and it's been a little fuzzy for me for a long time. Uh, but I I think it's more for cases where you want to share uh, users for authentication and kind of a, a bucket namespace across multiple sites, but you want uh, particular data to, to be localized within one of them. Uh, if you're requesting a bucket from one zone group that is resident in another, then you'll get a HTTP redirect to the correct zone group. So in that way, you can kind of see a list of all buckets and get redirected to uh, the correct location. Uh, so, but within a zone group also, zones may they need not be co-located, right? Right, yes. Um, the, the idea is that you're using um, zones for disaster recovery. You would have stuff clusters okay. and, and different uh, different sites, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we can have a bucket namespace spawned across zone groups. Right, yes. Okay. And uh, for multi-site replication within a uh, zone, uh, uh, how, how do we elect which RD, RGW server uh, writes into metadata or data sync logs? Uh, okay, so on the on the replication side, um, there's a config variable called RGW enable sync threads, and if you set that okay. to true, then we'll create the threads to run data sync. By default, that's on. So every every gateway in a zone would be running these threads and trying to get leases to run. Uh, the the processing. So the idea is that oh. the leases just help spread the work across all of those gateways. Um, and then on the on the right side, um, every write would would end up generating a log entry locally that that the other zones would replicate. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Any other questions? Okay, great. The timing worked out perfectly, just under an hour. Thanks, everybody. I'll Thank uh, you, share the recording. Thanks. Thank you so much.